Kokomo School Open Day uh, to, uh, to this lecture. I think uh, those people who are familiar with what's happening in, in, in Ireland uh, these days, as far as architecture is concerned, uh, know that uh, both John and Sheila play a very important role uh, in terms of the, the cultural life of, uh, of contemporary Irish architecture. I think even though they're very young, I get the uh, sense that I'm not so involved in the internal kind of dynamics of, uh, uh, and the politics of it, that they are really, um, um, I don't want to say godfather and godmother, but somehow they do, they do have this kind of uh, generosity and sense of, 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 of leadership. I, I get the sense that people really look up to them in terms of uh, in terms of their thinking, in terms of their practice. And, and they really are also wonderful people and they are extremely generous people. Um, what I think uh, is somehow very, very interesting in the Irish context, something that I think is probably very difficult for us to have um, in London, uh, partly because of the whole sort of metropolitan, the size of a city like London, is that there, there's sort of a lot of different things going on and it's very difficult for us to really notice a, a, a particular form of consistency in terms of, in terms of architectural ideas and architectural development. There are just far too many things. In, in Dublin you do uh, get the sense that there are a number of very bright people, very talented people who are engaged in the development of a certain kind of project and they have, in a sense, very specific commitment to uh, architectural practice that is engaged in a deep understanding of, of uh, contemporary programs and its relationship to uh, sort of mastery of construction. But having said that, then when I read things that uh, uh, both John and Sheila have written, they often talk about the fact that they are really not looking to, uh, to architectural precedents, maybe, maybe so much uh, for the kind of inspiration of their work, but to, uh, to cinema, to topography, um, and to, of course, certain specific traditions of, of, uh, of architecture. But the fact that they are really looking at things that are tangential on the side or, or directly influential, but, but not, uh, not really related to certain stylistic movements. And that's why probably, uh, that's why they say that every time they start a project, they're beginning it. As if it's uh, as if it's something completely new, and they want to look at it with uh, with fresh eyes. Uh, at the same time, recognizing that there is, of course, an undeniable uh, continuity in terms of how they have developed their practice and the kinds of interests that they have. So, this idea of being open, but at the same time recognizing um, the continuity of their of their work is uh, is very important. Again, um, now their 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 work is expanding to other parts of Europe. I know that they're they're working. In, in Holland, but of course they played a very influential role in terms of the, the development of the Temple Bar area and are doing now uh, a, a lot of uh, housing, uh, university buildings, school buildings, um, and uh, have always managed to combine all this work with a deep commitment to education where for the last, uh, I don't know, 20 years or so, been involved with uh, University College Dublin where they've been really uh, among the key members of the teaching staff, as well as, of course, uh, being involved in, in education in other places, including uh, DAA, Cambridge, and uh, Harvard universities. Uh, the latest news is that they have just uh, been selected for, uh, uh, for the Venice Biennale to represent Ireland. So without uh, further delay, would you please welcome Sheila O'Donnell and John Toomey. Thank you, Moisen, um, for your kind words. It's always a pleasure to speak in the AA and to visit London, and we're very happy to be here. John and I are both going to talk about our work tonight, about the work of our practice. And we're going to talk in different sections alternately, so you get a chance to have a bit of variety of speaker. Uh, as Moisen has said, our 
our work in Dublin is carried out in, it's a relatively small practice, so we have 10 architects and two administrative people, and we work very much as a team in a studio in the city, and John and I both teach, which is a really important part of our work and of our life as architects, and I think we feel that the continuing conversation with students across years has been a huge part of how our work has developed and a way of, um, particularly in a community as small as the architectural community in Dublin, that this, this conversation is critical to, to the work that we do. Um, the first part of the talk is has the title Building Ground. And these two images, which are not <coughs> by us, are both, uh, I think they're both very important at this point to how we think about work. And we would see them both as being very inspirational, but also almost aspirational. I think we would aspire to make work which has the kind of potency and power that, that these structures have. Both of them are in the west of Ireland. The one on the left is a swimming pool in, in the sea in Belmullet in County Mayo. And the one on the right is a ball alley for handball in a town uh, also in County Mayo. And both of these, there are many aspects of these structures which, uh, which we find exciting. Both of them are, are very functional. They're designed around a specific use in both cases, as opposed to do with sport or activity. But they also are both social. They're sort of social collectors. The Ball Alley, which was a common type built around the 1950s in lots of Irish towns, was one of the main social focuses of life in the town. And one of the things that I particularly admire about it is how brave these structures are and how strong they are. And they're built right on the edge of the main street in the towns, made in a kind of rough concrete, very expressive and in a way now very poignant because this, uh, they're not used anymore and many of them are being demolished. In fact, the one in the photograph has recently been demolished, much to our dismay. So we see these, they are traditional structures, but they're not vernacular in the sense that people think of vernacular architecture to do with being, to do with motif and detail. They're vernacular in that they grow out of a sort of uh, aspiration for a particular activity or um, for an embodiment of a use. And the one on the left, uh, I think the photograph is a very beautiful image because it was taken at the moment just when the tide was turning and the water inside the pool is rough and the water in the sea is calm. And that also, the slightly surreal aspect of that about the way that the, that the, the structure that's built into the water, which is almost invisible, has the capacity to change nature and to make a kind of ripple on the surface in itself is uh, something that, that I think we find very enticing. Uh, as well as doing buildings, we do quite a lot of very small projects and we have done a number of collaborations with artists. And these two images are of a collaboration that we made with a, an Irish sculptor called Janet Malarney who makes a very strong figurative work carved out of solid wood. And the project was to make um, an installation for sculpture in the grounds of a cancer hospital in Dublin. And Janet approached us to ask us if we would make um, a base for her sculpture. And we were, our design was to do with making a wall and a seat and a kind of shelter that would house the sculpture, but that would also give a place or a moment for people who are visiting relatives in the cancer hospital to relax or move away from the anxiety of the hospital. This particular wall and bench was not built, but uh, walls and benches seem to have occurred quite frequently in, in work we've done recently. This is a small project for social housing in a town in County Limerick. It's a planned town from the 19th century. A very um, simple plan, but very strong with the, the village square and four streets going out from the corners. And our we were asked to make a proposal for 30 houses to be added to the town, and the suggestion was that the site might be at some distance from the town, and we suggested that it should actually be attached to the fabric of the existing village. So our site is a, is a hill on the edge of the town here, and the first phase is 11 houses, um, one of, in two terraces, one of which follows exactly the line of the street, and the other which steps back up the hill, because the site has quite a strong slope. And the photograph on the right of the finished project in, is in black and white in a way intentionally to show uh, the, the new buildings kind of disappearing into the background of the town. The project 
as I said, is for two terraces. A single story terrace continuing the, the street, which is for old people's housing, and then a three story terrace behind, which has family houses and sits into the, the slope of the hill. And because of the way the slope works, there's a small elevation at the bottom here. Um, we made the buildings very simple. The, it was a very low budget project, and also there were some issues of discussion with planners, which meant that we had to make a continuous roof. So our proposal was that the roof is continuous, but it follows the slope of the hill. So the roof of the lower building is tilted in one direction, and the roof of the other building, because it's stepping back up the hill, is tilted in the other direction. So the two terraces sit in a kind of opposition to each other on the hill. And then one type of house is a uh, wide front, simple, uh, single story to allow for wheelchair access and for old people's use, which is this one, which is seen here in the model. Each house has a kind of threshold between the, the, the street and the building, which will appear in the next photo. The family house then is built into the hill with a bedroom on the ground floor and a bathroom for teenage children or a granny flat, and then living rooms in the middle and bedrooms above taking up the slope in the hill. And the, the construction is in what is now the vernacular in Ireland, which is concrete block cavity walls. But the, the finish is a, is a re unpainted render, which is colored with a local yellow sand. And then in order to uh, particularize or to focus on the, the moment of entrance and to identify each house, we have used color um, to a very small extent. And we've made recessed porches with uh, planting boxes and seats. And the flanks of each porch are in a series of five earth pigmented colors. And as you go down the hill, you see five colors in one direction. As you come up, each house has two colors, one on each side. And then there was a percent for art in this project. And we persuaded the local authority that we could use the art money for craft. And we invited some people that work for us in Dublin who make very good terrazzo work to come and make these uh, planters, benches, and recessed porches in polished terrazzo. And the photo on the right is of our column Ryan, the terrazzo man, gradually working his way up the hill, making each house's threshold. This project is a kind of hidden building. Um, it's actually in the Parliament building in Dublin, Leinster House, which is a very fine 18th century house. And our building, which is actually an interior, is the placing of an auditorium for school children within an existing room in this compl complex of buildings. It's a kind of lost room. In the past, when we were students, in fact, the, this group of buildings included the Parliament Building, the College of Art, the National Library, all in one group, all with entrances off a of forecourt, but with the kind of new emphasis on, on security and separating politicians from the public. The College of Art and the Library have been redesigned so they don't enter from the courtyard. And this room has been left somehow abandoned by the replanning with no use. And this is the door into the room. And when we were students, this used to be the main entrance to the National College of Art. And you went in the door and there was the stairs leading up into the building. In fact, we were involved with uh, colleagues, art students, in occupying this building and remember distinctly storming little cordons of policemen at this door. So we were kind of chuffed when years later we were asked to take this room and <laughs> change its use and redo the stairs. So there, there was a stairs, an ordinary stairs in the space, and our plan was to make the whole room a staircase as a kind of auditorium, a forum for democracy, for school children to see how their country is governed. So in plan, it's very simple. From that uh, arcade which you saw, you come in the door, which in fact comes into the side of the room, and there is a cranked stone auditorium which we built into the space focused on a screen here. Because the center, because the, the door is to the side and we needed to leave a route free to uh, a lower floor where there's press um, interview rooms, the center of the room is refocused, which is why we've made this crank in the seating. And there's an existing roof light, which you can just about make out dotted there, which also is part of the, the, the shifting of the geometry in the space. So in section, you see the roof light, the stepped auditorium, and then underneath the little room for press interviews of politicians. And then on the right is the, the stone landscape, which we've made using solid Portland stone steps. So this is a heavy, uh, it's a piece of landscape built into a room, really. And on the right photograph, you see a steel screen 
which was something that was asked of us as the project was ongoing. It was decided that the politicians being brought down for the interviews needed to be separated from the school children. So we were asked to make a kind of screen. So we built a, a very heavy, bright steel, louvered permanent screen, which makes um, a barrier between the two functions, but also which has a kind of um, modulating effect on the space. And then also the, um, it was decided that politicians and uh, adults would also use the room as well as school children because when they saw it finished they thought it looked quite attractive and it could be used more. And at that point they decided that those sort of people couldn't sit on stone steps so they asked us to put in some wooden seats with backs and well we did that but as you see the seats are actually quite um, minimal in the sense that they have very little and um, they're simple, very simple structures which sit loosely over the steps. We're going to be doing this. Uh, this uh, the, Sheila was talking about building ground, and I'm going to just say something about Inside Out, which is um, something we're very interested in, the relationship between the architecture and um, the architecture in the site in the sense of building the site, but also the, arch the building and the space that it makes within and without itself. Buildings are objects, but they are also um, containers, and, this, and they live in larger space than simply is measured by their external dimension. And um, I love this photograph. Uh, it's actually this photograph of the Corbusier Pavilion, the Prix Nouveau, uh, appears in an article that Alto wrote in, in the 1920s, just after he had seen the Paris exhibition. And um, we're kind of sympathetic with the idea that um, for Alto to stay sane, he had to leave home regularly. And when you live on an island, um, <coughs> you need to get out. I mean, Finland isn't an island, but it's a one-way street, I suppose. Um, Alto said that he was just speculating about this space, and he asked whether it was an elegant hall, beautifully open to the outside, or was it a garden in the building? And we're trying to think about space like that as much as we can. And then if you, in the movies, such as in the, in the Tarkovsky films, you, you see this most sublimely where he can move a whole landscape into a building, move a whole country into a building, which would be a modest aspiration for an architect. That's reverse. So two houses, we, we, um, I'm going to talk about two houses. We don't do very many houses. Uh, most of our work seems to be institutional or academic, I mean educational, public space kind of projects. And it's, uh, we kind of relish the chance to make a house. And recently, we've had a chance to make two, ha uh, two houses, um, both of which we hope will illustrate this interest between that we have uh, between building ground and inside out. So um, one house is in Navan, which is a midland town. It's actually built in a hole in the ground. And the other house is in Hoth, which is um, a coastal suburb of the city of Dublin, which looks out to sea. And in these houses, we've had to dig into the site, and we've had to involve the larger dimension of the external space. So to start in Navan, which we did about five years ago now, uh, this woman uh, is running a restaurant. This is her garden, and there's a hole in it, which used to be a shed. And the restaurant is in a house that was on the street. So the restaurant is in this house. They were living in the house over the shop, so to speak. All these kitchens came out the back and then there was what used to be a shed, which is this. And then there's a high garden. And that's kind of interesting. It's like the whole street is dug back. And then the gardens of the houses are a full story higher. So all the gardens around are high up. Like this is the neighbor's dog here, actually, at a level change to them. So they cook all day in the kitchen and work all night in the restaurant. And were going indoors and outdoors and had kind of colonized this external space. And it was the only piece of 
homemaking that they had done. They just lived in a flat over the restaurant. And they said, could we live out here? Of course, we'd have to lose our garden. And we said, maybe you should keep your garden and live around it. So our proposal was that they would just simply uh, 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 occupy the ground around the kind of empty courtyard that they were already so fond of. So we just dug the living room into one side of what had been the space of that court and pulled a tower of bedrooms um, out of the other. So this is a courtyard house, but the courtyard is in the ground, so the living room is, is underground. And the whole plan, uh, of course, you have to come in a door somewhere, but the whole plan starts around a court. So it, uh, at some point, this house attaches itself to the kitchens and to the sheds of their existing restaurant. You enter through a primary small courtyard into the slipped plan of the living space and out into the courtyard. So then we have to build it. And the only way you can build in such a site, we thought, was to build it in concrete. So we, and they, we built the whole house in concrete. Um, which is not done very often in Ireland, except in the case of ball alleys that Sheila has showed you. So we thought, well, maybe they could live within that kind of structure. So first there's the courtyard. And then pulling back from that into the living room, the living room, which is, so to speak, below the ground. I mean, the neighbor's dog is now free to walk over the roof of their living room. So the living room is like a cave that is open completely to the courtyard. And the ceiling, the concrete ceiling of the living room cranks around. And then the <coughs> bedrooms are in a very small tower across the way, which gives a kind of new social life to family life, and also gives a sort of commitment to the choice to go to bed early, because you've gone outside, and <coughs> it would be crossing the exterior to go for a late night cup of cocoa or something like that. And they live like this, and um, it proves to be really quite interesting for them. They cook, so they want to be sleeping in the dark, and they're down at kind of in a sub-basement, much like I am now to this lectern there to the courtyard. They have a daughter who lives in the middle and sleeps in a bunk that has a view to the stars. And then there's a other daughter who has a balcony up the back overlooking the garden. So you wind your way up inside this tower uh, between the concrete and the timber flooring structure. And then at the top, you look back from the upper bedroom windows across the courtyard, past the cranked roof of the living room, and back into the landscape, the urban landscape of, um, of Midland, Ireland. In this house, we had no treatment on any concrete or on any timber without any detail or without any uh, applied finish. And so when we left the house, this is a Polaroid, Polaroid snap taken as we kind of backed out on the day of the handover, reluctant to, ha you know, to give them their house. Um, and then they, ha then they move in. And just the interesting thing about that is that these people are not, so to speak, commissioning a work of architecture in the sense that they're not, um, they're not consumers. They're not, they don't have design or furniture, or um, they don't see it in those kind of terms. They rather see it as a, as a background, as a kind of given thing, that they live within the shell of this house. And in that sense, it doesn't feel like a new house. It, even though it's hard and built in concrete and actually has no lights, because you have, you, there's nothing in the ceiling, so you have to plug anything in that you want. But they live within it in the sa exactly the same way as they would live in a 200-year-old or a 500-year-old um, cottage, which we were interested in that. And now, um, more recently, we've just finished another house, this time overlooking the sea. And this time, the fix is not inwards to the courtyard. The fix is outwards to the island of Ireland's Eye, um, it's, there's a hill in Hoth which goes on from this model right down to your feet there. It's a huge slope and a harbour.
just around here somewhere where Peter is sitting in the harbour. And um, these people lived in that house, which they did up and spent money converting. It's a kind of Victorian villa with a turret and bay windows and a lot of rooms. And um, they had complete, completed their occupation of this 19th century house. And I think they felt uh, defined or confined in, the, in those houses that have halls with doors off them into rooms that are called names that you don't really understand, like drawing room, sitting room, dining room, living room, kitchen, scullery. And I think they felt every time they went in to sit in one room, close the door, light the fire, they kind of wonder what's going on in the rest of the house and how do we know we're in the right room and then it's back out in the hall again. And uh, a kind of restlessness is introduced by living in the structure of a former society without the bells to ring for tea or whatever used to go on. So as soon as they had that house finished, they, they thought that it had a very wide garden and maybe they could divide the garden and build a new house just for themselves. And uh, so they had the pleasure or the kind of experience of sitting in their house and looking out the window while the new house was built. And that's why we show these two houses to you together because they're both the same in that regard, that the people are living in the house looking out the window while the new house is being built. And uh, that introduces a kind of intimacy between them and their house and between you and them because you can't come to sight without meeting them and the whole thing becomes very personal. And so in this house we thought, well, it's not a very complicated site, it slopes. And maybe you would have uh, family activities at the back and you would have living activity in the middle and you would want to see towards the sea. But then we started to try to work with that idea. So it's simply, it's simply distributed like in three parts across the site and in three levels along the site. And at the, there's a sort of what becomes effectively a basement which is a, a kid's play space and a kind of service uh, utility space and a delivery, you know, a parking courtyard to get you into the scheme. And then you climb up either outside or inside, you climb up to the main living level. And here the rules are quite um, demanding because the house wants to face north because the view is to the north and the sea is north and the island is north. And there's a beautiful thing about looking north is that you don't have any light in your eyes, but you're looking at the light on the sea and the light on the island. And we were thinking of a poem by Robert Frost that says, the people along the sand, they turn and look one way. They turn their back on the land and they look at the sea all day. And when you're in that situation, that's what happens. You just are drawn like this. So we knew the house then would have to look at the island, but the island was not there, the island was there, so we had to turn the house to look at the island. And then the light is coming from the south, so we had to open the house to the south. And then the neighbors on each side, the ones who will buy our client's house and the ones who are living there anyway, cannot be overlooked because in a location like that every new neighbor is an intruder um, until you get to know them, I suppose. So the house is blinkered um, to the east and to the west. So all the rooms then take their light from the south or steal a bit of light through the roof. But they have these uh, guiding walls and are not looking uh, east or west. So they're looking out and out towards the island and out towards the sea. And then because we're bringing the light through the house from the back to the front, we can't have any cross walls. And so then the walls would not be stable. So we make the floors in concrete to give lateral stability to the structure. And that allows us to bend the walls wherever we like and to not have any frame. So the whole thing takes on a kind of thickness and a, and a solidity, even though it's open end to end and making a kind of a stone landscape inside. And the dining table is the center of family life. 
and then the house the house kind of spirals away from the table upstairs or into the kitchen and out to the garden so upstairs the same rules apply in that the given weighty walls have to be maintained and then we thought well there should be no other structure at all inside so everything else is made just by turning the floor up so whenever you want a shower or a bathroom or a balcony you just turn the floor up as far as you need to so all that second lining is made in timber and the bathrooms are kind of spiraled around their own roof lights that tie them to the sky and at the back or rather at the south it digs in in much the same way as the house in Navan dug in but maybe to a lesser extent each room digs in to make its kind of outside space or footprint space beyond it in the site and then it shears off at the at the view end and the house is transparent from front to back so we tried as much as we could that the kitchen and the family room which you which would be next door open out into these what we think of as a sort of dried out swimming pools made in concrete and then the house overlooks the harbour from its kind of perch on the outside uh, the thing about carving the walls is made to do with cupping the space inside but on the outside you'll get then these big fat kind of shanks on the house and we made that in brick and smeared in a kind of we got rock oxide and smeared it into raw lime to make a lime wash with the pigment of the rock oxide in it and you smear that over the cheap brickwork and it looks like um, elephant hide or velvet or cheap denim or something it gets saturated in the rain but you kind of pat it when you see it and these balconies allow the kids to be romantic and then it's just sawn off on the front because it wants to look at the sea so um, the kids are playing this is the kitchen with the kitchen table that looks to the harbour this is one of the kids balconies this is the master bedroom and the main living room with its sort of shifted light well and all the stairs and through to the garden at the back so now the neighbours have got to know them and quite a lot about their life habits I'm going to talk about uh, three schools now um, only one of which is built and one of which is under construction this school is in Dublin in a Georgian suburb it's in Ranala on the south side of Dublin and the, the site was quite an interesting one. It was beside uh, an early, fairly early terrace of Georgian, kind of mixed up Georgian houses, which were greatly loved by their occupants and about which there's a very strong kind of conservation lobby uh, in operation, who were very carefully watching for any developments in this part of the city. And then in plan, the site had this nice quality of being an island site with a main road running from the city out to the south a very small road which is the one in front of those houses and then two side streets also so it was like a small parcel of land uh, in some way kind of attached to these houses here but with the street running past and it was quite a small site for a primary school uh, st what's called a standard primary school by the department of education in ireland which is an eight classroom school which consists of eight classrooms and about three other rooms. So it's a kind of interesting brief in, in the extent to which it is completely basic. And it just consists of eight actually rather generous rooms for teaching, a teacher's office, a small general purpose room, and a staff room, and some toilets. So we I really enjoyed the prospect of working on a brief that was so tight and so in a way repetitive and rigorous. But the site, as I said, was quite small, and the tradition had been that primary schools are single story. And we quickly discovered that the only way to build on this site and to accommodate eight classrooms was to make a two-story building. 
And this was our first drawing, which is a, a concept sketch showing the school simply as a terraced building along the street, reflecting the brick houses which are built throughout this area, uh, hard to the street to allow a garden between the new building and the existing houses and to respect the fact that they now, before the building was built, had a garden and had some trees in that location. So we proposed a two-storey building hard to the street, which the Department of Education reluctantly accepted was, was, was a possibility in an urban context. The building has a, the site has a, has a slight slope, so yet again, the building is kind of built into or digs into the ground. And the slope worked well in a sense for us to make a kind of hierarchy or a zoning of the spaces within the building. And in looking at this model, going from the main street, which is quite busy with a lot of traffic, to the quiet residential road, which is about one and a half metres above the level of the street. We were able to accommodate the shared um, meeting hall, or the, 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 the assembly hall, which is quite a small room, is at street level with, an, with its own access door from the street, so it can be used as a kind of local village hall. And then the classrooms, the, the, the playground is terraced at different levels with ramps, and the classrooms are accessed from that side and are at the level of the yard, so there is a kind of cut in section between the, the hall and the classrooms, which then provides a, a sort of stage level to the hall. And the building then is in groups of four classrooms on either side of the hall, two at each level paired around uh, small courtyards. And the plan is very simple and is layered from the corridor on the yard side, which is very wide and faces south, through to the classrooms. And then each of the classrooms has a small courtyard shared with its neighbouring class. And this is one of, on the ground floor are the junior classes which have direct access to these courtyards and have a, the courtyard gives a kind of L-shaped complex shape to the room which allows for different kinds of activities to be zoned. And it also, by putting the courtyards between the rooms, it allowed us to make a kind of modulation of scale which reflects the scale of the Georgian houses in the context, which was a very important part of our argument to the conservation lobby who were very concerned about any buildings being built on the site. So in one sense, we wanted the building to have the character of a small civic building in this um, suburban village. But we also wanted it to in some way relate to the scale and uh, character of the houses. The, a, lot of the, uh, a lot of the rules are pre-established by the Department of Education. And one of them is to do with the materials that you can use inside schools. The walls must be unplastered concrete block all the services must be exposed, all the pipes must be surface mounted, etc., for reasons of cost and for reasons of consistency. So we were concerned to think about how we could enrich this uh, palette of materials. We, we were able, by using other arguments about um, thermal mass, etc., to make the structure of the building in concrete and to have exposed concrete ceilings with uh, flat ceilings. Which, which, is a, which was quite important because we were aiming in the building to have all of the materials in a way contributing to a sense of a kind of clarity or authenticity of construction. So we decided then that we would use colour as a material in the rooms. So when we were dealing with concrete block, concrete blocks have a quite a nice porous quality that when you put paint onto them it appears to kind of soak in. So we had been in Italy looking at frescoes and making sketches of, of uh, Renaissance frescoes, and we really enjoyed those colours, the kind of earth pigmented colours that you find in the frescoes. And the way that they are is red, yellow, blue and green, which are the kind of colours that people tend to call primary colours and put into schools. But we liked the way that there is a subtle difference that these earth colours have a much more complex quality than bright primary red, yellow, green and blue. So we actually using cheap paint uh, because we couldn't afford the, the pigments, matched the, the colours to these uh, fresco colours to make a kind of palette of the blue, the red, the green, which is barely in this photo, and the yellow, which is in the doors, to give a kind of warmth and depth to the rooms. And then the external walls of the building are white on the inside so that the teachers can use them as pin-up. The there's a roof terrace on top of the assembly room which allows the children in the upper rooms to, to have outdoor classes and to congregate during breaks. And from the roof terrace you have a view of the, the surrounding houses and this, the photo on the right is of one bay of the, the, the school building. 
what you might call the house of two classrooms. And we enjoyed the process of, on the one hand, relating. We used an old brick salvaged from an old building to make the, the building. And we used timber windows. And the, all the materials are untreated and unfinished on the outside. And we used windows of approximately similar proportion to the old houses. But by slipping the windows within the, the surface of the wall, we wanted to make it quite a different kind of emphasis and a shift, and to emphasize the sense of this brick wall which goes around the building being a continuous stretched surface um, which encloses the whole building. So there's a kind of conversation of agreement and disagreement going on between the new building and the existing houses. And on the south side then the building is much more open, uh, it's louvered and sh sheltered with a veranda. And the veranda forms a kind of informal entrance. There isn't really an, an en a main entrance door for the children. They all come in in the morning through the yard and then they kind of filter through this veranda, which is a number of different doors into different parts of the building. So that it's like a place of collection and a place of play after school and during break time. A tradition in the, in the kind of primary schools built around the country was that the schools were very basic and then they had uh, all this a kind of um, kit of parts that schools in the 50s and 60s were made with using an external covered play yard with a bench, a water tower and an outside tap. So we, we enjoyed those, uh, the kind of iconography and the sense of complexity that they gave to the life of the school. But we, in this case, decided to integrate the veranda into the form of the building. And it extends the apparent space of the school without extending the square meterage beyond the uh, area allowed by the department. And then in use at different times of the year, you ha we have the, 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 the play, the children playing in the cut-out playground with the concrete retaining walls and ramps at one time of the year, and then a kind of social life of parents coming and going in the little waiting area at the gate where we've planted two rowan trees, which were the trees traditionally planted at the doors of houses in the Irish countryside to, to represent welcome. In a very different part of Dublin, um, an area rather um, ironically called Cherry Orchard, we're currently designing another school which is very much bigger than the one in Ranelagh. And it's in an area of intense deprivation. Um, the houses here were built about 10 or 15 years ago. There's about 10,000 people living here in houses around huge open spaces. I mean, this is a, an open space with those little white things in the distance of the houses. So I think the people in the corporation thought they were being generous giving this big open space. But in fact, what happens is that the people who live there can't claim the space. They can't uh, assim assimilate it. They can't make it their own. And then it becomes taken over for antisocial <laughs> uses. And it's an absolutely awful place. And there is nothing there but houses. And there's never been any schools. There's a small church which is disguised to look like a house, which is here. And our site is the site beside the church, which this is a photograph of where we were asked to make a primary school for 500 children. And in, it's a prototype, it's an experimental prototypical school which has been developed for, particularly for this area because of the level of social problems. So the school contains a preschool nursery and an after school care facility and a canteen which other primary schools don't have. But unlike the last school, in this case, we were working in, an ex in a really exposed territory with no definition. So the concept for the building is that we would make an enclave behind brick-walled gardens and that the school is like a kind of place apart behind these walls of brick. And then the building makes a series of gardens and courts which the different ages of children uh, can use in a protected way. And in a sense, we felt the only way that we could operate in that landscape was to define the limits or the edges of the territory in which we were working. And the sketch on the left is our landscaping plan, which was done at, as in fact as part of the tender documentation and when we came to look more closely at the gardens we decided we would plant these um, stands of mature cherry trees inside the walls so the walls are made in brick in oh, we hope recycled brick if we can find it and then behind the wall are flowering white cherry trees so what we're doing is building a cherry orchard and we're hoping I suppose that in the future people will wonder why is the area called cherry orchard and they say oh it's because you know, the school has two big cherry orchards behind the walls. So for us, this is actually a really interesting project because it brings some of the issues from the last school into a totally different kind of territory. And there's an enormous amount of um, 
information in the briefing, which is all about how to avoid the building being vandalized, and every step of the way we had to think about how to stop people from climbing on the roof, how to stop people from destroying things. So it's about to go on site in March, and uh, we'll keep you posted on progress. At the same time, under construction in uh, a new town called Leitscherrein, outside Utrecht in the Netherlands, a very similar program for two primary schools working together as one a group of buildings called a kinder cluster, uh, being built under a very different kind of social system. Uh, Leitcher Rhine is under construction at the moment and will have a very big population. And as the houses are being built, so also is the school being built. So by the time the houses are finished, these schools will also be finished and ready for use. So the Dutch have a slightly different way of planning their expansions than, than we do in Ireland. So the, our site is a kind of leftover piece of ground in a way. It's a triangle of ground between a large park, which is actually called Waterwin Park, which is where all the water for the area is collected and brought into canals and then brought into a water purifying building, which is actually in the park. And the building site we are given is this triangle, which also surprisingly had a very slight hill of one meter, which I think must be one of the most uh, steeply sloping sites in the whole of the Netherlands. We were amazed to find that you could have a slope. And the, the brief was to make two schools, one a Catholic school, one a state school, and otherwise no difference between them. And we used the site as a way of distinguishing the two schools. So we proposed one school, which we call the street school, is built as a bar of building along a wide tree-lined street. And the other school, the park school, faces out into the park, and then between them are the shared facilities. And in the more developed design, the local children's library shields the sports hall here, which leads into a forum space with the street school around a courtyard to the street and the park school, a three-story bar facing the park. And this building should be finished uh, in the autumn. Backwards, sorry. Sorry. Um. Uh, quite some time ago, probably predating all the work that we have shown you, well actually al almost 10 years ago, we were commissioned by a community development group in the west of Ireland who go under the title of Connemara West. They're, uh, they're a kind of local initiative cooperative body. And the story in, in their uh, parish had been a continuous pattern of emigration and abandonment since, uh, since the, I mean, for a hundred years. So what we had were a group of school teachers and local community workers and publicans and local interest people who wanted to keep something going in the place where they live and to stem the tide of emigration. And they had taken over the premises of a former um, industrial school, which you see in this sketch. Um, an industrial school is a 19th century institution where urban truants and hoodlums from eight years old were sent uh, to be disciplined um, and trained into society. I think when they started in the 1880s, it it was in bracketed within progressive um, social concepts. But what it became was, as a system, what it became was one of the great scandals of Irish history, where institutions were isolated around the country, populated by inmates who were left entirely within the control of the institutions, unmonitored. So you have all the stories that you've seen in this films of the Magdalen laundries and the, uh, the various uh, repressive, um, horrible histories of the 20th century and in our lifetime. So this big structure was left under these big mountains in a place where no such structure existed. And the local community group took over the structure when the church institution retreated. So they were sitting in a very big, very cold building, and they had a kind of new mission 
uh, to continue the life of the locality, but independent altogether of its previous history. And so they started a program to make, um, first of all, local employment schemes, woodwork, carpentry. And then through contacts they made, they developed a furniture college. And then by the time we came on the scene, they had actually got a furniture college, you know, complete with Danish teachers and everything a furniture college requires. And students, and uh, all of them freezing inside in this structure. And the brief to us was to take the furniture college as a kind of a funding agency, but to take the spirit of the project um, on in some way and to project into the future to make a kind of new campus that would relate to the town. Uh, in Connemara, uh, just something to say about the landscape, two things to say about this photograph. One is no tree grows straight from the ground in Connemara. Um, the wind is king uh, and it's impossible to maintain an erect posture. You, you must lean. And we were impressed by that. But the second thing to say is it's absolutely beautiful place to look at now for us. But if you were nine and you had stolen some sweets from a shop and had never been around the corner from your house in the middle of Dublin, and the, the next Friday afternoon you were saving hay on the side of that mountain, I mean, that gives a whole, totally different sense of what a landscape is and uh, what fright could mean and what loneliness could mean. So there's something t to think about how we look at things and how they have been looked at. And we have some transformative role to play. And then the other thing is the natural materials are so strong and the color of the earth is so strong and the stones have such color that we tried to work with the plasterers to develop recipes that would incorporate the dust of the stones into the plaster to give it a color that belonged to the landscape. So uh, to just describe what's going on in this project, that's the institution um, clipped slightly of some of its more repressive um, amplifications. It used to sit around a courtyard where the boys, when they were idle, uh, were trained to march up and down the courtyard to patriotic tunes. And they also had cold showers in a shed at the opposite side. And we felt that the prison yard had to be changed and that the closure of the institution had to be changed by shifting its center somewhat. And so we tried by cropping the building to kind of open its form towards the village crossroads which is here. So in our minds we are unwrapping a closed institution and turning it around to engage with the larger uh, landscape and depriving it of its axial um, certainty. At the same time, it should be said, and just for completeness it has to be said, that before the Christian brothers brought their regime to Connemara in the 1880s, two people came from England in 1860, a Quaker couple called John and Mary Ellis, and built this house. And that was when, um, post-famine Ireland, when people were really dying in the fields. And these Quakers uh, carried out a huge development project, training stone masons, planting forests. Uh, they did six years. Six years sounds very short to me, but they did an enormous amount of work before getting uh, pneumonia and having to come home to England to die. But we were interested that the Quakers had built a little institution on a piece of cut ground. And the Christian brothers had built a large institution on a kind of shoulder of built ground. And now we had to extend this pattern of building on boggy ground. And so that became part of the project. So in this construction site photo, you see one of our big um, machine hall sheds <coughs> nearing completion and the other one in the course of construction. And you see the institution behind with all its memories and in this model, you see the layering of the idea we had about 
building in relation to the hard shoulder and the, and the boggy ground. Um, the ground is very uncertain and we had very little money <coughs> so each leg is independently founded on a kind of a cheap uh, concrete tube, concrete core foundation which is sunk independently into the bog and then each of these hammerheads balances a long ground beam that sits securely on the hard shoulder of what is the territory that the institution is built on and then that raises the building out of the wet altogether and makes a platform. And then subcontractors come along and build a completely independent timber frame that has a point of connection with the concrete hammerhead and as a sort of arch truss to take light in from the north and to lean away from the wind and under the, under the mountain. And then inside that, that space, you have north light and ventilation at each fold in the structure and views out here down to the bog down below. And the structures are indeterminate in that they can extend in either direction, but they're clustered around this, this new forecourt, which moves the door to here and makes the former yard into a garden where a cafe and library stand. So we have a library over a cafe, we have a hand bench workshop, and we have a machine hall and a kind of furniture restoration, a local radio station ex extending the local hall, and some old workshops where the carpenters used to work. And in the bench, hand bench workshop, we tried to aim for pure north with one big structure that would take daylight from the north and would allow them to work in a big open 20 meter square studio um, with these little ventilator windows t to make the room into a kind of zoetrope for the landscape. And then in the library, which is in the former exercise yard, we made these planter boxes to kind of prevent any more marching and raise the library like a box of books up on its concrete founds, which is where the cafe opens out. This building is still, I mean, the yard is still incomplete and the library is in use. And then the library lifts its lid to look towards the mountain. So within is just lined like a cigar box, lifted up to catch the diamond hill. So in this project, which is not yet finished and at this point looks like it, it will see us out, uh, this project has engaged us in a more complex way than could be defined as professional architecture because it has engaged us in, in a communication and in a kind of sharing of belief or, or ideas with people who are not familiar with the interests or with the obsessions of, of architects. So when we say something about the structure having to lean and the trees bending, these are forms of language which we're speaking directly to the people who are commissioning it. So when they put the timber structure up, you know, and you're on site, you meet one of the local farmer directors who is speaking to you and saying, it is a bit like a tree in the wind, isn't it? Or, you know, who, it means something to them and they must, because it's their individual and collective shareholdings that make it possible. So in some way, I think we're trying to make the buildings integrate with the landscape and with the social sort of depth of the place in such a way that it becomes permanent or a permanent, a permanent embodiment of a kind of social idea. The, the next part is also educational. Uh, these are two buildings, two university buildings in Dublin, one recently completed and one uh, competition. This is a, 
a small laboratory for medical research in University College Dublin. The, it, the UCD is a very typical 1960s, 1970s campus with a lot of disparate buildings connected by long covered walkways and vague spaces with there's a pond, a big pond here known as the lake and it doesn't have very much cohesion or form. And our site was on the periphery of this uh, campus route here. And it was for um, a kind of high powered medical research uh, facility associated with a rather more standard uh, routine testing procedure for viruses. And there was an existing building, which is the virus testing building, small L, a U-shaped, single story, very uh, inauspicious structure. And then our site here, which was the last building in the campus, the, the main motorway which connects the campus to the city is here. And then there's some, the one very good thing about this campus is the landscaping. It's, uh, the landscaping is very well maintained and there's very beautiful trees and they have very good gardeners. So we thought we should make use of the kind of landscape aspect. And also we realized when we visited the site that there is from high up there's a good view to the north to the sea to Dublin Bay. So these, these establish the context. And then, so as I said, the brief was for a very interesting man who's a, um, a professor of medicine, but his work almost overlaps with a kind of anthropology uh, to do with, um, on the one hand, identifying viruses, but also being interested in a kind of tracking of where those viruses come from and where they occur. So a lot of his time is spent on the Amazon trying to identify viruses by that remote tribes have and connect them to other places in the world. So his, his work is, brings in lots of different fields and we found, it was a competition, we found him really interesting and his way of thinking about his work and the intensity of that impressed us. And then there is the other part of the building which he was rather snooty about, which is where they just bring in lots of samples from all the hospitals in Dublin and test for viruses. And that had to be in the building as a way of funding it. So this is our first con concept sketch. And our idea was that, that these research uh, laboratories were really more like studios. They're like artist studios. So we wanted to raise them above the ground with big north facing windows, which would have a view out over the sea through the trees on the campus. And then the second element in the sketch is the chimney, that there are enormous amount of fumes which have to be discharged about five meters above the height of the ceiling. And we didn't want to have hundreds of pipes sticking out of the roof, which is what characterizes laboratory buildings all over the rest of the campus. So our idea was to funnel all of the pipes into this big chimney and emit the fumes on the side. So this really is a kind of uh, summary of, of the form that, that oh, sorry. So the building, actually like a lot of the other ones I've been talking about, to some extent this is built into the ground because there is a bit of a slope on the site, but it breaks into two parts, the ground bedded part and the part that's raised above the ground on, on skinny legs. So it has a kind of lofted up and built in uh, dual aspect to it. The, the lowest level is the entrance from the campus and just has an entrance hall and a library meeting room which looks out straight into the garden with a small staff canteen and a big stairs which leads up. And the photograph on the right shows where the library meeting room is on the ground floor. And then at the main upper ground floor level, the routine testing laboratories are collected in a single story building around a planted courtyard. And they share these technical rooms with the um, more high power laboratories which are in this block at an upper level. And we were very keen that there would be a view as you moved up the stairs. So at this level here, when you arrive at the top of the stairs, you're here in section and you can look over the roof of the library and under the laboratories out to the garden, which you can somewhat see in that photo. And this section maybe more clearly describes that condition. Also in the, there's a, the hall of the building which separates the laboratories from the offices is a wide space with the stairs going up one side which makes a kind of social area which runs the height of the building. So at the top of the stairs you look out to the landscape and then you move up into this social area with laboratories and offices with the single story element on the right. And in this building we're working with um, very light, with this, it's a steel frame construction and the building is entirely clad in uh, grey through coloured um, fibre cement panels, so it's again a very cheap, very simple construction and we hadn't used this kind of construction before and we spent a lot of time thinking about how to 
work with those panels, which I'll talk about in the next image. In the laboratories, we have floor-to-ceiling glazing, and then the write-up areas where people sit and write their notes and conclude their experiments are at lower areas beside the window so they can look out at the view. And then the, the panel we used as a, with a kind of staggered joint so that it covers the whole building, uh, not expressed as, um, as a frame or as a, as a grid, but as a kind of continuous uh, surface. And then inside, all the details are made in steel. The building, then the big chimney has the, the uh, extracts on this side facing north oh, to suit the wind. And our idea, is part of the reason for the raising up into the trees was that we knew that the people working in, in the building were going to be researchers from all over the world and there would be a, there's a kind of intensity about this activity and people come for maybe a month and they work late into the night. So the part of the, we thought of the building as a kind of beacon that these big studio windows would be lit up at night and that in a sense it's a kind of gatehouse for the campus because when you come in the main gate in the evening you see this lofted up skinny tall building with these, with these bright windows. Trinity College, the other main university in Dublin, is a very different campus. It's in the centre of the city and it is, the earliest part is a 16th century, some of the buildings in the middle here from 16th century and then this group of buildings gradually developed between the 16th and the 19th century and it has a very formal layout of continuous um, sequential squares and beautiful ranges of simple granite buildings moving from college green back in a clear geometric progression. And then at some point in the 20th century, they started to build another group of buildings at the east end of the campus, which are mostly the science buildings, and they are on a different geometry and are separated by this, the, the main playing fields and park. And there's a kind of uh, chasm between these two parts of the campus, which are connected at the moment. There's a row of Georgian houses here, which are owned by the university, which both connect and in a way separate the two ends because these houses don't know whether they belong to the street or whether they belong to the campus. They have a front to the street but they have no doors and they're socially very um, negative in that they f feel closed to Pier Street. But on the other side they present their backs to the college and the college has built a series of kind of ad hoc structures against those. So this was an invited competition where 10 architects were asked to make a master plan for the piece of ground which is what they call the Pierce Street end of Trinity with an existing Georgian houses and with the possibility of building on a building facing south over the park. And our scheme was a way we were trying to work with a way of somehow connecting and integrating the two geometries of the campus. And the first move was to make a, a major new entrance gate which we call the North Gate which makes a uh, permeation of the closed uh, line of the Georgian houses to Pier Street and gives, uh, picks up on the existing network of paths within the campus and balances the existing south gate here where ABK have built some very fine buildings. So that was our first move to open the campus by making a hole and knocking down five uh, Georgian houses in this location and wrapping a building around to make a gate. But on the other hand, we're also trying to make a simple building which encloses and relates to the, to the park facing south. So we've made a kind of broken-backed building which continues the geometry of the campus and then cracks to, to relate to the geometry of Pier Street. So it's a quite complex project which here works with the existing houses and makes a series of internal and external connections at different levels, tying in lecture rooms and big workshops at the lower levels and then with uh, generic teaching undergraduate spaces raised up in four stories above those levels and the, the teaching buildings the new structures we propose would be um, glass glass walled buildings with floor to ceiling height granite movable shutters which would operate to control the light on the south side so we're trying to relate to the simple granite ranges of the buildings that are on the campus at the moment but we're also working with the building which, ha which can accommodate the um, different size of spaces that are required for contemporary university faculties and also for a necessity to change and um, alter the space as through the life of the building. 
that the first part of this has just gone in for planning permission and I think a bit like Connemara West it'll probably see us out as well um, recently we won another competition for a very different kind of building which is um, a theatre in Belfast um, the Lyric Theatre on a site on the edge of Belfast City at the end of a whole series of red brick terraced houses on an interesting site which is triangular and faces the River Lagan which is down here and has a slope as you come down to the end of the street. So there's a red brick terrace is running that way as part of a big grid which then peters out as it comes down here to parkland facing the river. And the Lyric Theatre has been in existence for about 50 years um, but for the, since 1970 they've been in a building purpose built on this site a 300 seat auditorium which is showing a lot of signs of wear and which is very uh, has no backup facilities no rehearsal no proper backstage and is is in need of um, demolition they have decided so the competition was to propose a new building on the same site with a bigger theater and with a second studio theater and a proper rehearsal space but the, what interested us is that the, the Lyric is a producing house and they're the only producing house in Belfast so they make and put on their own plays and they have a very strong uh, important cultural presence in the regeneration of the city of Belfast and in a way have kept going through all the troubles that Belfast has had so they are very important in, in the cultural life of the city. Our proposal was to make an auditorium which is a form in the middle of the site which is a big box made in Belfast brick which is a very particular type of red industrial brick and then to wrap the rest of the facilities of the theatre around that and to some extent to unwrap because of the, the significance of the fact that they put on their own plays and make their own productions we wanted some of the traditionally back of house functions to be brought to the front so the auditorium is in the middle and then the the dressing rooms and backstage are obviously at the back but then it begins to unfurl and the rehearsal room has a key position up in the air at the front under which people enter the building so we wanted to make the to think of it as a house a house for the Lyric Theatre where all the people who work there would in a way have a kind of presence to a visitor that comes into the building this massing diagram shows the idea of the auditorium in the middle we, the, there was a requirement for a, a fly tower, not a very high fly tower, but nonetheless that there would be one. And I think we had a kind of antipathy to these theatre buildings which just have a big box sticking up at the back, which you know is the fly tower. So we moulded the form into a kind of um, angled shape where the, tower, the fly tower is absorbed within um, the slopes of the form of the auditorium and then the circulation and other aspects are wrapped around that and in the street because of the hill we were able to make deliveries and vehicle entrance at the high point here and cars can drive under the building and out at the low point point. and on the all the performance spaces are at first floor and there was a uh, also an aspiration in the brief for multifunctional spaces and this is a diagram of our first floor with a big triangular rehearsal space and the studio theatre and the idea is that all these spaces could open to each other so at times a uh, kind of promenade theatre could take place where the audience and the actors move from the rehearsal room through the upper foyer into the studio to open up the life of the building and to animate the circulation spaces. The auditorium then inside the brick box is, a, is, a, is lined with faceted timber which would be worked to work the acoustic and then it is a very quite steeply raked single rake auditorium with no balcony for 400 seats and this was our response to what we felt is the way that the theatre works, the way that lyric work and the way that they relate to their audiences, that they had a particular interest in this kind of end on performance. The one thing we did was to very slightly crank the rows of seats along this line which is to do with the geometry of the form which gives a kind of sense of enclosure without uh, making it um, a curved uh, forum theatre. And then the building sets back slightly from the street the audience and public ramp up to get over the cars which are below into the entrance under the rehearsal room where people can in which is glass and then move up through these stairs to the auditoria which are upstairs in making this building we were conscious that sometimes there will be hundreds of people coming to performance but other times there'll be small numbers of public either there during the daytime in the cafe or for lectures or talks so we wanted to make the public space as a kind of interconnected series of slightly separate or 
at separatable spaces so that as you move through you're constantly winding around or slightly changing level with ramps and with showcases and elements. So you enter here past the ticket office, past a, there's a long bar looking out over the water. There is a collection point and then the big stairs coming up so that the, the public spaces are modulated and the scale is varied. And then on the upper level is the level I've showed you before where the, the two auditoria have their entrances and the rehearsal room which has a series of uh, swing doors which can make it either closed off or open. The rehearsal room is glass with uh, t timber louvers up to first floor level so it can be closed for privacy. And then the big stairs is like a kind of, it's a brick stairs which is a promenade where the audience can become part of the, the performance as they move up to the spaces. At the top there's a, a foyer outside the rehearsal room where you can stand and look back down at other members of the audience arriving. And you can see here the steepness of the rake and the lining of the theatre which will be worked up further with our acoustic and technical people now. And where the lighting and technical areas are concealed above this uh, chamfered ceiling. And then to the street the, there's a glass facade behind which can be read the, the box of the auditorium and the uh, rehearsal on the corner. And our idea is that on the opening night that the rehearsal room is a kind of lantern or beacon. It's a symbol for the building. It can be seen from a distance. Um, it is a kind of embodied or occupied sign that says this is where we make our plays, this is where we, ha we are. And that faces also out to the riverside where the auditorium and uh, where the cafe and bar open out. The last section. Uh, this building is currently under construction. It's the last building we're showing you this evening. Um, and it's due for completion in the summer. The uh, context is un uh, another university, this time in the south of Ireland in the city of Cork. It's a very beautiful stone quadrangle built in 1850 that wishes it was in Oxford, in made in a white limestone. It's actually designed by Dean Woodward, who then came to Oxford to design the Oxford Museum after, after uh, they were spotted by the... Um, it's a long story, but worth telling. So what I'm interested in about the sighting is that the architects were asked to select the site for the university. I imagine none of this was built. The river was winding through. The city is over here and the architect tramps out of town to find a place to put the university and finds a rock over a grazing meadows and makes it there and the whole thing happens. And all this I think was floodland. And in the early drawings of the Gothic 19th century university, these are grazing meadows with cows and uh, simple folk below. Um, because of, I think because of the flooding, this area which is called the lower ground was never built. And so it became a kind of parkland to the university. And this is the main gate to the university where it meets the town. <coughs> From here on you're in urban Cork and this is the kind of parcel of the university ground. Um, the river doesn't flood anymore because it's controlled now by engineers. And our brief was to make a new art gallery in this lower ground which had never been built in. And that the art gallery might be a kind of a place of congress between town and gown where <coughs> citizens would feel like students and students would feel like citizens and they would meet each other at the gates of the college and in this haven of 19th century parkland landscape. And there had been some studies made of that site by previous master planning architects for the university who, because of the sensitivity of the site, had suggested a single story building, um, which actually would have covered the whole site, um, to, I suppose, to focus on the river. So we suggested that maybe you should build the tiniest footprint you could make and rather build high among the trees and then keep the relationship of the building with its campus. So 
there's a difference, quite a difference, as you can see, between where the University Aula Maxima stands and the ground down here, which is where some people were, would play tennis if they played tennis in Cork. And, and all around are marvellous trees growing. And we made a suggestion that but just below the university, from here to stand some stairs, we would make one new wooden bridge across the river and link across to the other street in the town and so pull people through this secluded site towards the site for the gallery. So it's an incredible situation really because there are no buildings. I mean there's a huge university all around you but you're entirely surrounded by beautiful tall trees. And we said just we, before we did anything else we said we won't move any trees all the trees will stay so then we had to think how do you build between the trees and so close to the trees without endangering them and now it's seven stories high and which is sort of at tree top level and all these trees are staying in place I hope at least for one season and the way it's happening is that the building just draws itself in at the lower floor so we have the advantage that the main avenue up to the university is rising up here. And so by the time you get to the point where you'd want to come to our gallery, you're five meters out of the ground. And then you carry on rising all the way up to the college. So we can enter at that point. And that means that we're above what could be below. And we're below what could be above. And we're trying to make the space between unbuilt. So our first models are about a kind of suspended or elevated gallery in the trees and a kind of suppressed podium in the ground. The limestone that the university, the, the stone the university is built out of is limestone, which comes out of that escarpment that it stands. And we thought that we would continue that limestone landscape right down to the river in stone. And then in the trees, we would raise a timber building um, among the trees and we would let people just walk on the ground in between without them having to go up or down and the structure idea is just um, if that's Sheila's notebook is just that you do that and so the building has a small footprint so the roots of the trees are free and then it spreads out like, like that to engage with the trees and if you were able to see through here, that's the soffit of the gallery and you can see straight through to the river. And that's the stone base that you will walk on, which is here. So down below in the lower ground, on the what has been known as the lower grounds, below the stone podium, we make a kind of carved out cafe that faces west across the parkland landscape which we have protected by not building on it and which will now become a kind of piece of landscape which is regarded within the protection of the cartilage of the protected structure of the old university so it's preserved in perpetuity so no one can build between us and the university so sitting in the cafe you dream about the college and people are walking above without knowing that you are below. And then the building above is, is, in, is, miss, is just missing the trees for where it has to and looking back towards the university where it can. So at podium level, the imprint of the building is just exactly that just as a glass sleeve there. There's a stair up to the gallery. If you were able to see these slides in focus, you wouldn't believe me, there's a stairs to the gallery. And there's a big lift because everything has to go in by lift. So you have a small footprint on a large plinth with kind of uh, finger connections to the river, to the avenue, and towards the town. And people can walk over this platform. In fact, you can drive over this platform because you have to be able to take 
sculptures, and uh, a lot of sculpture is heavy. And then on top of that, on top of that podium, and all its service rooms are down below, on top of that is elevated this sort of transfer structure. And on top of that transfer structure is built the cage work for a timber gallery series. And the gallery just starts to spiral as you climb, giving you walls for display or windows for the river, walls for display or windows to look at the college, walls for display, and then walking around. And in the middle, there's a kind of core in the middle here, which is a black uh, museum space, which is the only air-conditioned space we have where they can hang something very important or where they can have multimedia presentations and be away from daylight and natural conditions. And then the whole building is kind of spiraling around that. And by shifting that volume half a level in gallery terms but a full level in ordinary room terms up, we make this interesting kind of inverted courtyard like carved out space in the undercroft of the building. And then at the top, when you get to the top, you've arrived here, and the direction is the other way with windows back towards the town and a much more enclosed sense of exhibition. And then a quick stare down and back where you started in a kind of, in this sort of uh, movement system. The thing this model lacks are the trees, and what is important is how close to the trees you are. Like here. Um, we knew how close to the trees it would be, but and you draw them at a decent distance from your site plan. But it's quite remarkable to come this close to a branch, you know, outside the window. And indeed that the branches of the trees are coming in underneath the cantilever of the canopy. So that's one of, that prow there is one of these bay windows that sort of situates you right in among the branches of, of the trees and looking back towards the college. So if the building was behaving itself, it would be a closed timber box, if you imagine it like a boat. In fact, it is being built by boat, boat rights because they have to bend the timber around, as only boat rights know. But then if you just imagine the boards open like that, uh, under pressure or something, then you get windows without making windows. You, it just swings open like that. And then at that point, you get the complexity that gives you scale and gives you cross views up and down stream uh, without looking directly out. So um, th that's, the, th that's the kind of what I'm calling the inverted courtyard. That as you climb up outside and without going into the building, you're kind of drawn up. If this was close encounters, you'd be drawn up into the underbelly of it, or people up there would see you passing by, and you would feel closer to that kind of engagement, and you would begin to turn your head and walk up the stairs and start the system uh, beyond. The cantilever on the concrete is 12 or 13 meters from here to here without any uh, propping structure, so there's a lot of confidence needed to walk now underneath while it's being constructed. And what we have in mind um, is uh, something like the image that is described in a, in a Seamus Heaney poem called Climate Noise in his lightning series where he describes a celestial ship. Um, the opening of the poem is a ship appeared above them in the air. And the celestial ship is sailing in the sky over the Abbey of Clan Macnoise. And its trailing anchor snags on the altar rail of the Abbey. And one of the monks, the abbot, instructs one of the monks to try to free the anchor. And the, one of the inmates shins down the rope and works with the monk to, shin, to, to free the anchor. And then he, when the anchor is freed, he climbs back out of the marvelous from which he came. 
and the ship sails on. And we thought maybe that a wooden vessel straining against a stone terrain would be a way of imagining um, a building built on a site where no building is meant to be built and would be a way of clarifying the relationship between what is special and what is embedded or something. And uh, unbelievably, um, the president went out and raised the money to build the bloody thing on the strength of that description before we had drawn a line. He engaged us because he was interested in our process of thinking, which we have tried to reveal to you tonight, about the understanding of context, the, the continuity with history, the reading of the site, and the analysis of the problem. And then following our selection for the project, we went to meet him privately, and he said, true says I have no money. Uh, so what, what would you do if you were doing something? And we said, well, of course, as we've explained to you, we would start the process. And he said, that's exactly why we engaged you as architects, and that's why, that is what we believe in about you. So can you just skip that bit now and tell us what the building's going to be like? And he gave us two weeks, I think, just before Christmas, um, to go home and think and come back with something that he could raise 10 million with. So we just came back after Christmas talking about Seamus Heaney. And he went to America and came back with 10 million. And um, it, it's, go it's going to be finished in the summer. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Sheila, for a wonderful lecture. I hope that uh, you will engage them and ask some uh, questions, uh, um, especially maybe those people who have uh, just joined us tonight uh, for the Diploma Open House. Um, I mean, one thing that I would like to, to ask, and maybe it's a slightly unfair question, is that, um, you know, at the beginning, um, I mentioned basically quoting you that uh, obviously every project is something very new and you're working with sort of different ideas uh, but I suppose also after now 20 or so years there is a substantial body of work that's uh, that's there and you try to in some ways deal with them through making different categories or kind of grouping of, of projects uh, maybe it would be um, it would be great for us if you could um, say something about the trajectory of the work, projecting a little bit into the future. What sort of things do you uh, <coughs> would you like to, to to work on in terms of issues or topics? Because many of the things that you are dealing with are very specific to do with site, this project, you know, this tree. Um, uh, but in some ways, now also, I think it, it touches on a on a on a kind of enough of a, of a continuity of ground in terms of certain kind of discourse. So like they uh, ask with the actors and they say, I want to play Hamlet or something like that, uh, without, without it becoming a building type, it also touches probably on certain characterizations or certain, certain conditions of, of performance that the actor would be, would be interested in. And so I know, uh, John, you've been doing uh, a certain bit of uh, reflecting over the last year, especially with your with your writing and so on. It would be great if you could uh, just uh, project a little bit into the future, uh, <coughs> reflecting about the past. What of you? Uh, yeah, well, it's nice to, it's nice to be told that, that we have a body of work because what we actually have is a precarious existence, I think. And um, what we've shown you tonight our projects from the last, uh, in general, from the last five years of our 15-year um, partnership, which I involved um, five years of getting ready, um, five years of work, which we didn't show you here, and 15 years of frustration, I think. 
because we've just gone from project to project and tried as my son says tried each time to start at some kind of beginning but rather maybe start from something fundamental and i think out of that we certainly have some interests that maybe put us in a little bit uh, of a step aside from um, from the cultural mainstream of architectural discourse at this moment because we have some attitudes about time and about form and about construction that link us into the long-lasting tradition or continuity of architecture. And when we say we're not looking at what's around us, I mean, we're looking at everything that's around us, but we're believing that the buildings that we see are useful to us in making buildings that we have yet to make, if you know what I mean. So we are leaning on buildings that are built to imagine what might be done. So we're absolutely dedicated, I think, to the field of architecture in its constructed uh, actuality. I, Bob Maxwell is here, so I have to say actuality and not reality, because the actual is what's brought into being and the real is what merely exists, or something like that. Uh, so yes, we really do think that form embodies meaning and that form that meaning lives through form so we trust the, the object to carry the value and that's I think that's very important to us but really I think we're interested um, in strategy and I think we're very if I say frustrated I think we're interested in strategy at a different scale than at the scale of an individual form because if uh, if the building if the if the city is built I mean if the, if the world is a built reality then it has form and it should be possible to project a sense of strategy beyond simply the form of an individual building and we are we feel constrained by the questions that are asked of us which are rather confining to buildings and we're straining I think to extend ourselves to make more of the place and the potential of what's around us so what we yearn for is scale I think to engage strategically and formally I mean that's what we imagine I think maybe you think that no, I don't think differently. And I think that's right. We want to be able to kind of get going with something. Something starts and has a kind of scale of repetition or typicality, which to some extent the projects we have are, are very particular. And we seem to always get very particular sites which have really strong physical characteristics. I think we hope that the Trinity College building, the one with the stone louvers raised up above, it to some extent would have some of that loose fit kind of scale that we would like to be working with and that of course is very frustratingly slow as well because there's all kinds of objections to us knocking down Georgian houses and the university doesn't have the money and but I, we believe that project will happen and it's a, that is like maybe of the work we have that is the one that offers the most um, free sense of making a building which has a kind of typical or a repetitive aspect, which is something that we would like to do now. Yeah. We're working on some bigger ho social housing projects now, but they are tending also to be confined by clients selling off bits of sites, and the site gets smaller and smaller, and you're more hemmed in. But sure, housing has some of that sense of um, repetition and loose bit of needing to be, especially social housing where you have to make a kind of unit that any person can live in. That's actually quite interesting when you're not working around a specific client, but you're working around just some sense of how people might live. So we do have some work which is different from what we've shown that the Trinity and the housing, but I think we still would like something uh, much bigger. <laughs>
Uh, it's very nice to see the work. Uh, great pleasure to enjoy the lecture. Uh, one thing about your work is that when you were first working, you worked with uh, fairly orthogonal building arrangements, and you didn't mind symmetries. And it's interesting in the more recent work that you've tried working with freer form, formal arrangements in some way, just literally different kinds of shapes. I just wonder where you think that might go, and how do you react to this, this adventure you've taken on? Yeah, I think in... I mean, it's, it's certainly true what you say. I think in our very early work, when we went back to Dublin, having lived in London for five years, we, were, we went through a period which was interesting of consciously examining the, the um, store of buildings of sort of vernacular or typical structures in the landscape in Ireland, which because we knew there was something different about the way buildings were made in Ireland than they say they're made here, and we had to almost work through a process of examining and analysing and understanding that. And I think our work that we made, the early work, which also was mostly quite small things, individual houses, was probably quite directly influenced by that. I think in a way certain projects like the Irish Film Centre, which we didn't show tonight, which involved a very complex series of existing buildings in the city, kind of pushed the work into a more free form where we were, rea where we were reacting to and relating to existing forms. And it may even have been the move up in scale to, because the film centre was the first bigger building that we made. Uh, maybe it's also just a kind of confidence of having taken on that the st some things were overt in our earlier work about a reference to a kind of Irishness as it used to be t talked about then. And I think we've, you know, we felt that that became absorbed and didn't need to be overtly expressed anymore. Though in relation to things like the structures we showed at the beginning, it's still very much a part of how we think, but we believe that should be kind of inherent or um, sort of endemic but not expressed or not uh, in, in the form of the work. In terms of how it's going to go, I don't know. And I still do think that the forms of the buildings relate very much to the site and to the, the, the program. The Cork building is moving and curving around the trees, whereas the housing projects we're doing in Dublin, both in the centre and in the suburbs, are much more orthogonal and work with context and um, with topography. Um, do you have anything to add to that? You're supposed to get freer as you get older. I mean, rigor. Yeah. You know, you're supposed to relax as you get older, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> We're not as young as Moisten introduced us. <laughs> anyway, the trouble with form, once you take responsibility for it, is it's even stricter than than it was before. <laughs> you know what I mean? You become responsible for every single uh, manipulation of it. And I think actually that all that's happening is a closer commitment to the actual form, you know, rather than simply trusting a type. But compared to what you guys are used to here, this is not free. <laughs> But if I if I if I listen to uh, Sheila carefully, she was saying maybe this is the interpretation, but she was saying that the, the Trinity College building, uh, which is a kind of orthogonal building mm -hmm. of sorts, uh, not being so focused on uh, the kinds of conceptions of detailing mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. your court project did, talks about a certain notion of loose fit, which is different than the symmetrical and yeah. orthogonal yeah. of the Irish modernist uh, yeah. period and is, is somehow more of a loose fit within a different kind of uh, orthogonal um, than, than, than that earlier yeah. and is not so dependent on the, the, yeah, the kind you know, of manipulation of the, the details as the court. was to make it 
I mean, the task was to make a pavilion. It has to be. Yes. In fact, the building uh, had to perform in that sense in order to exist. But I don't think there's any sense that we intend to become kind of boutique designer architect. No, Sheila said you want a lot of big buildings <laughs> <laughs> where but there's I a lot of repetitive structure <laughs> and, and big fees. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The thing of strategy, <laughs> the thing of strategy is, is uh, it should, oh, you know, it should be the thing that gives it, that informs it, that thinking. That's right. <laughs> Paul. conversation with Jim Sterling, he said to me, uh, I don't look at what's going on. I only look now at old buildings. But he was looking at old buildings. And this was in the early 70s, and he suddenly went homo, which I still have to apologize for to some people, and there were other people I don't apologize to. For St Sterling, I think, was above the current tide. He had a, a reference that went back like his old buildings, he admired the way Louis Kahn admired Scottish castles, for example. So he allowed that dimension to come into his reflection. And so I can't help feeling that maybe something of Sterling has rubbed off on this couple, who seem to be now be well placed to re replace the Smiths as the voice of the next generation. You've got you've got a sense of form, you've got a sense of discipline got a sense of frontality, but you've got angles, in bending, in curves, you've got all sorts of things as well. And the whole thing doesn't look old, it looks modern. I would guess that this is the way buildings are going to be looking in the next 25 years. I just want to say I really enjoy their work. When, when you talk about building ground or inside out, uh, specifically about the inverted courtyard or the, or the courtyard which was between the living room and the kitchen in the first project, what it's exactly is that, that interests you? Is it the, the, another way of performing in the space or, a, or an ambiguity in the space as well? Or it, does it have to do with the dyn dynamism in, in, in the way that that a new user approach to that specific space? No, no, I, I, I think it is the relationship between private world and public world. That, that any building built, I mean, by building a building, you're contributing in some way or you're uh, intervening in some way in the public realm, even with a private building. So when you extend When you engage the conversation between what's outside with what's inside, then you're making a commitment, a kind of a social commitment, is made by the building to its place. Which, I mean, these, these people living in that restaurant are not, I mean, we just gave them an urban scheme, if you like. Uh, and, but we were trying to demonstrate something about in our minds, I think we were trying to exercise something about the place of building in the in the world in which it stands. At a, I mean, it's at a tiny scale, but you couldn't have the one thing then without it having hooked the other. So it's quite—I mean, it's quite uh, ideological, actually, to, you know, to, uh, and and quite s stern, probably. That. Uh, that society and individuals make have a collective, you know, that there's something going on between them, and that uh, every chance you get, you try to engage the work of an individual with the larger world of the order of life. 
even if it's a house, you know, I think. So it, it's formally interesting too, because you lose definition between one thing and another. But I think the drive is the idea of rooting it somewhere. You're building the world in your head, you know, sort of. But also, you are just accommodating life. And I think we find, you know, in the climate that we live in, which is very like the climate here, only maybe a little bit milder, a little bit wetter, there is a really interesting thing that outdoor covered space is very usable and extends and accommodates life in a different way. And I think that aspect that on the one hand, the reasons you do things are very formal and hard, but on the other hand, they're also just to do with a kind of ease or simplicity of use and accommodation. And I, mean, I think that word accommodation, both in terms of describing the space, but also the way that people's lives can be eased or can take over or appropriate things, that those kind of in-between spaces often make it easier for people to use and uh, own the buildings that you make. It sort of blurs an edge between the public and the private and allows people to, to take ownership. But the people in that house um, think it's their idea. You, you know what I mean? I mean, they that ownership question. Because you can't make people, you can't make people behave. Well, maybe in America you can, but you can't make people behave, live in the houses the way you tell them. You know, because people have a whole way of living which they bring with them. All we do is just put some sort of container around it, I think. So it has to be loose enough for that. Thank you. Um, it's as much an observation as a question, I guess. Um, I enjoyed the consistency of the work and a word that just occurred in the last sort of set of observations you were making about the way the work is grounded seems very particular to all of the projects that you've shown. And it, it feels that a lot of the projects have a simplicity in plan, but a complexity in section. And the thing that seems so interesting about the last project you showed, the gallery, as perhaps a, a demonstration of this kind of search for where the work might be going is that it had complexity both in plan and section. And it was both grounded, but it was like, like the trees that surround it. And this seems a very, very interesting way of working, I think. And it would be good just to have perhaps a few more comments on some kind of reflection on this, this project and its, uh, it, its quality as a way of going forward. We find often projects, you're working on two things at the same time and they kind of move in pairs. And I, the, house, the house that we did looking out towards the sea was being designed at the same time as the gallery. And there are some, I mean, obviously they're very different because the house is built in masonry and is, is, uh, is very solid. But there is some kind of connection in the way of thinking about plan and of kind of molding and moving through space in, in those two projects about kind of, uh, in both cases, the building is sort of bent to, in the case of the gallery, to, to avoid the trees, in the case of the house, to look towards the sea. And yet, I think we've also tried to constrain the extent to which they're curved or bent to the just as much as is needed, so that the rooms are still have straight, relatively straight walls and are calm. The gallery, I think yeah, for us, the thing you've said about it being both grounded and raised is uh, is interesting. And we felt that coming out of the ground, you know, having talked about so much building ground, it's actually quite nice to sometimes to just come. And that's, I think, why we're so excited about the big cantilever, because it is a very different kind of structure than the other things we've done bedded into the ground. It happens in the laboratory as well, where and maybe it's to do to some extent with the programs and the sites of those buildings that they have both, in both cases there are the trees and there's a distant view and there's a sort of slope on the site. I don't know whether, I mean it's sometimes difficult to generalize <coughs> because of the extent to which certainly the gallery is very particular in its program and in its site. It's 
hard to know. I mean, John has already said it was by definition a pavilion. It also was dealing with this limestone escarpment. But, of course, out of the particular, you develop general ways of working. And I think we are really enjoying that kind of manipulation, like the inverted courtyard, those kind of spaces, which have come out of that context, but which could very easily appear in a different, more typical way in later work. I mean, I think the difference, just having been on site last week or something, the difference is that building is no bigger than any other building that we showed you. I mean, we're kind of boxed on a certain size of the project. But the difference is that the volume, instead of it simply being a plan relationship between inside to outside, when it's a volume relationship with inside to outside, the scale of the building is much more generous. And it feels, for the same amount of building, you get a much fuller volumetric engagement. And I think that gives us a kind of a sense about what to emphasize and what to restrict, you know, which could be useful when you're not doing galleries, maybe. Well, thank you very much, John and Sheila. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just also mention that Catherine Cook will be giving the first of her series of three lectures beginning at 5 on Thursday on Soviet architecture and planning. And Jeff Kipnis will show a film, do a performance, and give a lecture at 7 about projects of Frank Gehry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a very nice show today, actually. So it was nice to have you.